name is Tom Keating. I'm a writer in the Boston area, Massachusetts. And my uh, story is called Renf, R-E-M-F. Richie handed me a bandolier. Another fucking waste of 12 hours, he said. The green cloth pockets each held a magazine filled with 18 rounds for the M16 battle rifle slung on my shoulder. It was almost 1,800 hours, and we were going on perimeter guard duty till 0600 hours the next morning. 98 degrees, and our jungle fatigues are now soaked with sweat. We loaded up on the truck in the company area for the guard duty, which we were assigned to do, which we were assigned to do every couple of weeks. 12 hours sitting in a hot, wet, smelly sandbag bunker on our sector of the Army base perimeter. 12 hours of boredom. I'd rather be typing the fucking monthly fuel consumption reports, I replied. This sucks again. Can it, you two, and get on the truck, yelled Sergeant Hollis, the sergeant of the guard for this shift. The 12 of us climbed onto the open truck wearing helmets and heavy sweaty flak vests, our rifles slung on our shoulders. The truck drove out to the perimeter along the dirt road behind the tall barbed wire fence of our base. Two small Vietnamese villages were just 400 meters from the fence, and the locals who lived there would come into the main gate each day, get checked by the MPs, and then go to work on our base as cooks, laundry workers, and housemaids. The combat troops called us remps, rear echelon motherfuckers, support troops that made the war possible with our typing, driving, computer programming, other work skills needed for this modern army. We do the paperwork that feeds the war and everything from body bags to bullets. Our, living in, our, li our base and living quarters, the grunts called luxurious. We had beds, daily hot ch chow, plenty of water, and in some cases, worked in air-conditioned offices. Most of the soldiers assigned to this logistics base were trained to be army administrative types. Some, like me, who were trained in the infantry, were assigned as clerks or typists when we arrived because the army marches on paper. I knew I lucked out with this assignment instead of being in combat. Every couple of weeks, we're pulled from our offices, trucks, and repair shops and thrown together for bunker guard duty, strangers to each other. The truck arrived at our bunker, our bunker situated on large earthen berms on the perimeter near one of the gates into our base. The truck stopped and Sergeant Hollis got out, walked over to the rear and said, Kearney, Phillips, Ritchie, Denton, you four here in bunker number one. We hopped off the truck. Someone handed us our weapons, our flares, ammunition for the M60 machine gun, extra canteens, and a box of sea rations. Richie carried two rolls of toilet paper. The truck drove down to the next bunker, and we waited while Phillips picked up a stone and threw it into the bunker. Hope old Snakey ain't in there today, he said. Cobra snakes loved our bunkers. They provided shade for this cold-blooded reptile, who also enjoyed the rats that lived there. We threw stones into the bunker to let Snakey know we were coming in. Sure enough, he slithered out, an eight-foot-long cobra. The snake turned and retreated into the brush near the barbed wire. Phillips threw in another rock and waited. Nothing. We carefully entered the bunker, our home for the next 12 hours. There were no bushes or tall grass around our bunker. The defoliant spray every week made sure of that. <clears throat> I set the machine gun on, on its bipod Positioned out the center bunker port. We took off our helmets and our flak vests and settled in. The heat and stink inside the bunker was unbearable. Richie and Denton went outside behind the bunker to smoke some weed. Phillips and I took the guard position, looking out at the villages. Phillips said he was a truck mechanic for the 350th TC, Transportation Company. A short, stocky fellow, he speaks with a hillbilly accent. Kearney, where are you from? He asked. 
Before I could reply, Richie came back in. Richie was tall and lanky. He shoved his glasses up higher in his large nose and announced, put on your gear. The sergeant's coming to check and he's got the LT with him. We put on our helmets, shirts, and vests and waited. Sergeant Hollis called us together outside the bunker. Lieutenant Knack, the officer of the guard, this shift, stood behind the sergeant. Knack's tailored fatigue, fatigues were dark with sweat. Hollis was an experienced soldier who had fought in Korea, and he gave us our instructions. Okay, you guys know the drill. Two on and two off, two hours. Kearney, I want you on the machine gun. Richie, check the comma line. You are Reno 4. Do it now. Richie picked up the field phone handset, pressed the key and said, Bravo 1, Reno 4 comma check, over. Richie put the receiver down. We're good to go, Sergeant. Sergeant Hollis replied, okay, do that at least once an hour. Me and the lieutenant will do another check later tonight and bring more water. Anything else, Lieutenant? Max stepped forward. He wore the custom fit new model body armor jacket that zipped up the front. Stay alert, men. Keep your eyes open tonight. Intel says we are sure to get hit by Charlie. He stepped back. Knack worked in the finance office, probably hadn't fired a weapon since basic training or whatever reserve officers went through. They turned and got back in the Jeep and left. Phillips asked as he took off his gear, Kearney, you think the LT was just bullshitting about an attack? I don't know, I replied. It, it is the big Chinese New Year festival. I would expect them all to be celebrating, not fighting. We settled in, looking for any movement in front of us. Denton and Richie relieved us two hours later. The sun was almost gone, so Phillips and I went outside where it was cool and fresh. Trucks and jeeps kept coming and going out of the gate near our bunker. Phillips used the piss tube alongside the bunker, and I sipped warm water from my canteen. Just then, the field phone chirped. Richie picked it up. Reno 4. His eyes got large, and he looked over at me. Roger, yellow alert, Reno 4. Yellow alert meant some shit was going down. <clears throat> Excuse me. We hustled back into the bunker. I drew back the cocking lever of the machine gun and put my shoulder against the stock. I looked out the port. Richie and Denton picked up their rifles. Denton looked confused. He didn't know what to do. I looked over and said, Denton, put the magazine into the rifle, then pull the charging handle. Put your selector switch off safety to fire. Richie, give him a hand. These guys were clerks and typists, not infantry. Finally, the rifles were locked and loaded. We waited. I saw the gate being closed. Vietnamese workers on the post were being hustled out of the gate as it closed. A military police jump, police jeep pulled up to the gate with an M60 machine gun mounted and manned. Damn. We have to check the claymores to be sure the wires are OK. Who wants to go with me? Phillips nodded his head. Okay, I said, Denton and Richie, eyes front. If you see anything move, shoot it. We'll be right back. The two of us exited the bunker and found the Claymore wires leading from the bunker. We followed them along the fading light to all the way to the mines, which were 30 feet in front of the bunker. Everything looked okay. The wires attached to the blasting caps front toward enemy. We ran back to the bunker. I heard a rumble like thunder. The phone chirped again. Richie answered. Understand, red alert, Reno 4. Richie hung up and relayed the news. The VC are attacking Benoit Air Base and we may be next. Holy shit. We were getting jacked up with adrenaline and fear. The booms were louder and they were closer. The stutter of a machine gun could be heard. The field phone chirped again. I picked it up. Reno 4, I said, into the handset. Reno 4, stand by. Victor Charlie spotted in the village 400 meters your front. Tack air on the way. Get low in your bunker. Roger, Reno 4. Get down, I shouted. Tack air. Everyone crouched down below the sandbag wall of the bunker. We heard the roar of an F-4 Phantom jet and two large explosions. The F-4 Phantom roared away. I cautiously looked over the sandbag port. 
the villages were gone, just smoke and fire. Nothing was moving in front of us. I looked over to the gate. The MP jeep was gone, replaced by an armored personnel carrier, an APC. Before I could process this, we heard more firing and some small explosions, grenades most likely. Then it got quiet. The firing stopped. Nothing moved. The phone chirped again. I picked it up. Reno 4. Reno 4, stand down from red alert. Alert status now yellow. Alert status yellow. <coughs> the sergeant arrived shortly after we started to relax. LT wasn't with him. I told him our situation. Sergeant, we're on red alert. I looked at my watch. 60 minutes ago, just got word to stand down the yellow. TAC air blew up the villages to our front. All weapons are locked and loaded. Okay, Kearney, stay alert. This may go on all night. Hollis drove over to the next bunker. I turned to the others. Let's get back on the guard schedule. Two on, two off, two hours. Stay alert. If you think you're going to fall asleep, move around. Take deep breaths. Me and Phillips will take the first watch. <clears throat> Phillips and I looked out the bunker towards the destroyed village. Damn, the jet just blew it away. There were people there earlier. I hope they got out before the bombs. Jesus. No movement at all. We could hear the chatter of machine gun fire and explosions far down the perimeter on our left. The APC roared away towards the fighting. We were alone in the darkness. Kearney, I I'm scared, said Phillips. Me too, I replied. The lights at the gate cast some in front of our bunker. Richie and Denton were napping outside. The sounds of battle diminished. We started to relax. After 40 minutes, I was fighting the urge to close my eyes and sleep when Phillips whispered to me, Kearney, I see somebody moving. What? Where? I jerked alert. I jerked alert. Over to the left. See it? I slowly turned left. And yes, someone was slowly crawling toward the bunker, two on our left. A sapper. I turned to my right and saw someone else crawling to us. Two sappers. <coughs> They got through the wire somehow. We're about 40 feet away. Phillips, I whispered, you fire right, I fire left. Go. I fired my M16 four times at the guy. Bunker 2 must have seen the Sapper 2 and fired their M60 machine gun. The red tracer rounds bounced off the ground in front of the crawlers. The Sapper on the right got up on his knees to fire a B-40 rocket at our bunker, just as Phillips hit him. He fell back and the rocket went sailing over our position and exploded behind us. Denton and Richie were now wide awake. Jesus, you got them, shouted Denton. Keep looking, I said, there may be more. My heart was pumping fast, my vision had sharpened. I scanned in front and on both sides and even looked behind us, but there wasn't anyone else. <clears throat> my infantry training told me to go out and check the bodies. I ran, crouched to the first body, his body was deformed by the rounds he took from the M from me and the M60 from Bunker 2. His right arm was missing. Picked up his rifle and slung it on my shoulder. I checked him for papers and found some. The B-40 rocket guy was 20 feet away. Phillips' shot had blown his head apart. I wanted to throw up, but I held it. I picked up his launcher and the rockets he carried. No papers on him. I ran in a crouch back to the bunker and <coughs> <pardon me. coughs> I threw up outside the bunker entrance, then went in and picked up the phone. Bravo 1, Reno 4. Reno 4, weapons fired to enemy kilos. No whiskeys. That was Army code for dead and wounded. Two weapons recovered. Roger, Reno 4, continue alert. We could hear some explosions and rapid firing along the perimeter, but it was quiet near us. Phillips looked at me. His eyes were wet. I shot deer and squirrels back home, he said, but these were men, Jesus. I don't wanna do that again, Kearney. I know, I said, it, it, it's fucking awful, but they were gonna kill you and me and Denton and Richie. We didn't have a choice. 
shit, said Denton. I got to get out of this fucking bunker and this fucking country. <clears throat> Shut the fuck up, Denton. You just got here, said Richie. You ain't going anywhere for a year. Kearney's right. It was us or them. Phillips went outside, still upset. Denton and Richie took over the guard. I stayed in the bunker. I was suddenly hungry, feeling lightheaded as the adrenaline left me. But I could not relax though. Time passed and we heard no more shooting. When the sun came up, smoke was rising from the village. The two enemy bodies were still there in front of our bunker, flies feasting on them. We heard no battle noise, just a few random rifle shots somewhere down the line. Sergeant Hollis, Sergeant Hollis and Lieutenant Knack were coming down the access road in the Jeep. Hollis stopped the Jeep and I went out to meet him and Knack. I nodded at Knack, no saluting officers near the wire. Sergeant Hollis said, situation, Kearney. Sergeant, all quiet, no further attack on this section since 2,300 hours. Two dead sappers out front. I policed their weapons and some papers taken from their bodies. I pointed at the two weapons and the papers tucked in the corner. Knack looked startled. He scowled at me. Specialist, who told you to take the weapons and papers? Hollis rolled his eyes very slightly. Sir, I said, that's SOP. Disarm the enemy dead and check for any intel. That's what they told us at Fort Jackson. Oh, you were an infantry, he snarled. Yes, sir. Well, you should have left those weapons, the weapons there and notified me. He wanted credit for the weapons capture. It would look good on his record and maybe a medal. He took a small notepad from his breast pocket and a pen. I need your name and your unit commander. Sir, Specialist Fourth Class Kearney, I am an administrative aide to General Stark at Headquarters Supply Fuel Division. Knack looked surprised. That brought him up. He didn't want to fuck with one of the general's boys. He put the notebook back in his pocket. Okay, Sergeant, take charge of the weapons and documents and contact the engineers to remove the bodies. Yes, sir. He went into the bunker and retrieved the weapons. Kearney, I'll make sure you get credit for the captured weapons. Knack threw an angry look at the sergeant as Hollis put them in the back of the Jeep and climbed behind the wheel. <clears throat> Thanks, Sergeant, I replied. Good job, men. Your relief is on the way, the lieutenant said as he hopped back into the Jeep. Hollis drove away as the field phone chirped. I picked it up. Reno 4, alert status yellow. I turned to the guys who were dirty, tired, and still jacked up on adrenaline. Alert, leto, alert yellow, we can relax. Then we heard the truck coming to bring us our relief. It was 0700 hours. I took off my flak vest and sucked my canteen dry. Phillips had recovered somewhat and he smiled at me. I could hardly wait to get back to those fucking fuel consumption reports. The end. <laughs>